We thought it would be interesting to go through some, uh, some edge cases of uh, this model um, from what we see in the community. And since this is um, a, um, let's say, an objective map uh, based on the assumption that places are objective, um, it fall breaks apart in certain uh, areas. For example, this is something we saw very early, which is an island, uh, uh, an, uh, an island group uh, that is um, where both um, Japan and Korea claim uh, that it's their island. And that, of course, means that, and interesting for context, this is how uh, Mapbox uh, solves it, which is that they look at your IP and then they change the map based on where you're based as well. <coughs> so, uh, and we can't do that. So we have had a number of challenges from both points that have gone from, it's actually solves itself. It started with pretty aggressive messages and then it got challenged and then it reached some kind of like agreement uh, that it's a contested area and here uh, yeah it, it goes both through the Japanese and Korean name and the kind of agreed upon was some kind of middle ground but you as you can see there are a lot of red dots here that got challenged off the graveyard uh, yeah. what the graveyard yeah the graveyard of points um, and I know that like I think a few days ago this flamed up again so like, I think that what's interesting is also deploying a model like this and then seeing where it, where it uh, falls apart a little bit. Um, and yeah, we can't do this really <laughs> uh, because of the uh, shared database. Um, this is another point if you want to go into it. Yeah, this point has been, the, I think this point has survived the most challenges, uh, whereas some of, the, some of the points on the rocks, uh, they, they just are removed from the map. This point is actually surviving all of its challenges. And it appears to be kind of a challenger that uh, just wants this point off the map. And, and there's no other way to put it. Uh, so in, in kind of investigating uh, who's starting these challenges, some community members have found that you know, some of these may be connected. So what we see is you know, somebody starts a challenge, the challenge fails, that same person starts the challenge right away, it fails, that same person starts the challenge right away. The challenge reasons will be things like, I don't like the name, meat is murder, you know, this type of thing. Uh, and in some cases, the challenger has tried to use reasons that uh, uh, are probably not accurate. So in this case, they contested the address, uh, but somebody in the local area had a business card from the restaurant and posted the business card on the forum. And so forum members saw that, you know, this, it seems legit where, where it's put and, and the challenger lost. What, what's important to note maybe is that this, this view is something we developed after. In the beginning, um, people didn't know that was the same person challenging. So you see this challenge opening over and over again. And like these edge cases also are really, really good for understanding what tools we need to build for to kind of um, combat some of the information asymmetries between community members and also in the technical knowledge differences between community members. Even something like navigating uh, my Etherscan and looking at uh, the uh, challengers uh, is a hurdle that uh, creates information symmetries, which results in impacting the voting uh, on these challenges. Uh, yeah, small point. That this is a view we are now, we can now see, and we'll go through that later, but that wasn't possible then. Uh, it's minus 120 token withdrew. What uh, so when, when the original point owner wins a challenge, as this guy has, uh, they receive 60% of the tokens okay. back into the point, and then they can withdraw them from the point. Yeah. So it, the challenge has made him rich. Exactly. Well, I and wouldn't say rich, but in fact, uh, <laughs> covered gas costs probably, yeah. We, we have a leaderboard, and, and sorting the leaderboard by map rewards for this month, uh, the, top, the first place person doesn't have any any points, any challenges, or any votes. So what's happened is he had a very high value point that was challenged, and then that challenger lost. Mm -hmm. And so that, that person had something like 16,000 foam tokens or something deposited uh, oh, into his point, yeah. <laughs> and, and they're just kind of sitting there, I think, at last time I looked, so. Uh, but right now he's leading, leading the leaderboard for, for this month in map rewards, and, and it's, yeah. 
And yeah, the, the money we're talking about is that the may, like the best challengers have a few thousand bucks um, yeah. plus during the lifetime of this. So it's, let's say it's a, it's a hobby that rewards, uh, but it's not, yeah, it's not a full-time profession yet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, What's the value of a phone? Right? Um, I don't know four what the cents. current... Like, huh? Four cents. Um, what, about, what about things like, for example, um, military bases that are not supposed to be on maps? And I mean, the military can go to Google and say, look, you, you take this off the map. It's not supposed to be on the map. Whereas here, you can't really remove points unless they're challenged and then... Well, I mean, that's, again, we're, we're not solving the issue of blockchain data. No, but I, it becomes your issue. It's like, you know, you've created this and then, you know, if the military really says, look, some people have been putting military bases on, they have to go off what you tell them. I mean, it's, it's, I, we would have the same problem as if someone publishes the, those military base locations on the blockchain without using our... Like, I, I don't think, I, I, I understand what you, but I, I'm not in the position to answer the, the larger legal question of uh, uh, um, legally uh, problematic. Physically, uh, technically able to remove it? No, you wouldn't. No. You wouldn't, right? Even Since I'm not in foam, I could just say that. Put your gunpoint. Would you be able to remove it? No, you wouldn't, right? No. You could challenge it. I mean, this this puts like it. This is part of a larger conversation regarding how we look at blockchain data um, uh, and and the potential legal problematic overlaps with the existing uh, um, um, legal frameworks. Um, I'm again. This is the same problem that anyone that has in uh, is my EtherScan responsible for me publishing military based data via there. No, but the thing is, I mean, you're presenting all this data, right? So if it's just sitting somewhere, it could be anybody could say that. But if it's on there, everybody sees it. Sure, but we could remove it in the front end. We could remove it in the front end. Oh, okay. So we have the same possibility as anyone to remove something on the front end as if anyone who displays this data. Anyone can, can also uh, use our uh, front-end solution. Also, I, I must say, like what you're seeing, this whole tool is basically the curation layer for uh, interacting with, uh, with uh, these spatially specific uh, points, this registry, but anyone can build a front-end that displays some of them, that displays other of them, and uh, yeah. So, uh, you mean, I, I mean, in illegal, we haven't been in that situation, and I'm not saying that's the direction we're, we're taking, but I, I see that would be potentially one solution, similar to to. Have you thought about like larger actors kind of coming into the foam network, and kind of playing it to like for economic gains or? So this this is something that of course every TCR um, has let's say a fear of. Um, we're gonna go through. Some so we have a lot of material still. Uh, uh, I mean, we're we're right now in the beginning. How, what, how are we on time? <laughs> okay, everything is all right. Maybe we should. We're gonna go through some. We're gonna go through specific challenges that that speak to this because we have we have a lot of things happening. Uh, so we can talk to that. Um, I mean, it's a it's a problem. But any any of the basic TCR uh, models have that problem. We have some proposals from the community how to combat that. Though. Um, okay, you want to... So one thing I think is interesting is the efficiency of challenges on the map. Uh, uh, kind of early on in the map process, we saw a lot of low quality points being added to the map, but not being challenged. And there was an issue of kind of discoverability. Uh, and so one of the first things that I did is uh, a community member is kind of figure out how to ch check every day of what new challenges there were. Uh, and I ended up posting these uh, kind of in an email called the Daily Digest. Uh, and what ended up happening is that challengers got pretty quick at, at going through the map. And uh, at this point, when new points are added, they're usually curated in the first maybe one, two, or three days. Uh, now, that said, a lot of the points that are challenged are, challenge are very, very old. And what's happening in this case is that very high value points uh, are being curated over and over and over again. So almost every time a new cartographer is getting into the map, they're sorting the points by the amount staked in the, in the point, by how much they can win if, if they challenge the point successfully, 
and then going through and kind of curating them one by one by one by one. And so every now and then as, an, as a new cartographer comes on or a new challenger comes on to do this, we kind of just see these, you know, a, a couple high volume points every day getting challenged for, for a week period or, or something like that. And so in general, the points are being very well curated. But that said, uh, the higher value points are being curated to a much uh, uh, finer level, I guess. Yeah. Over and over and over again. Um, okay, so we kind of set the, the explain the framework and then explain uh, the uh, like the what people have done so far um, and the how the challenges are going and. Um, We've been thinking a lot about how, now that we deployed this kind of, uh, this, this smart contract, these, these basic smart contracts, what are ways to incentivize uh, growth on the phone map, which we've kind of been successful at, by using other incentive uh, types um, than the uh, uh, direct intrinsic financial incentives in the smart contracts uh, of the TCR. Um, and we're gonna go through three things. Um, um, the proof of location, uh, we're going to go through kind of games and we're going to go through uh, gamification and NFTs as like its own category. Um, but the first is proof of use and in the foam uh, token uh, kind of uh, sale, um, there was um, basically to ensure that people weren't speculating on, uh, on with the tokens. Uh, there, were, there was like a two part process, there was a pretty uh, complicated um, not complicated, but um, uh, uh, a process that ensured that you were well informed about the protocol. And there was basically a questionnaire, and if you didn't make it, you couldn't purchase any tokens, uh, utility tokens. Um, and secondly, there was um, the, you had to understand that you were supposed to participate in the protocol uh, if you uh, purchase a utility tokens. Um, so you, there's something called proof of use, which is that a percentage of your tokens need to be used within the network um, for you to be able to move them at all. Um, and this created um, a kind of very, it created a, a, an incentive, of course, to use um, the FOMAP. And what we saw, maybe you want to go into it. Yeah, so proof of use required that not only use a certain amount of your tokens, but you also place at least 10 points. So you had to place 10 points before your tokens are unlocked. And for a lot of token purchasers, that's a pretty powerful incentive. So we can actually break down, you know, what is incentive for proof of use at the very at the very highest end, and uh, anything above that we can say is is kind of just just because people are having fun or for other reasons. And I think that the other reasons are probably related to adding network to the adding value to the network in in terms of if there are more POIs. The network will be more valuable and therefore my tokens will be more valuable. Uh, but I do generally think there is a subset of users on the map who are enjoying adding points and enjoying contributing uh, in the same way that OSM mappers contribute uh, uh, to, to that platform. Right? So the area in blue are the, are the points added by uh, token purchasers uh, that fulfilled their proof of use. And then once their proof of use was fulfilled, the area marked in orange shows the rest, re the rest of the points that they've added. Uh, and then anybody who is not a token purchaser is added in, into the orange area. And so there are about 1,000, just, just over 1,000 token purchasers. And so the, the most the blue area can go up to is 10,000 points. Right? So right now it's about half that. And what we see is, uh, right before the tokens, the first eligible time that the tokens could unlock, there was a bump in the amount of points added, especially for uh, points that counted towards the proof of use. And then over time, that's kind of drawn out. And what we see is that you know these early uh, token sale participants uh, uh, have not been, been attracted to kind of add their points and, and move their tokens yet. Um, what's also interesting is that this both adds an incentive to uh, add points, but also um, it makes it necessary for everyone to understand the system. Um, there's like a, a whole learning curve associated to it with a kind of reward at the end. Um, 
And that's how you get people to actually use the system for the first time and find value in, in adding points. And we have like a people adding points going through America and ground truth thing to uh, like there's there's a bunch of uh, uh, cases of people that participated in the sale and then have continued uh, as you can yeah. see. And and this is I mean this is great this is great from the standpoint of kicking off the network. I mean I I'm not sure that. Uh, uh, just the orange area would have would have happened in the early early days had it not been for the proof of use points added due to proof of use. Yeah, and it also gave us uh, a lot of uh, data and or community uh, action in the beginning to kind of fine tune uh, the uh, both the kind of uh, information layers on top, the tool sets needed, and we're more and more in a situation where it's actually more fun to add points. In the beginning, it was it was uh, pretty harsh. And then we could fine tune the process with a lot of the uh, initial uh, uh, utility token purchasers uh, that, uh, yeah. Uh, so if I look at it, I, I would say like you have about 4,000, a bit more than 4,000 uh, points mandatory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that means you had about 400 in investors, like 400 wallets mm -hmm. investing. Okay. Well, we had uh, no. We there was there was like a there was one thousand and two, so a lot of haven't yeah. done it yet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So about fifty percent have not done it. Um, um, what I don't understand is how you have you have to add at least ten points uh, before <laughs> your tokens are unlocked. But to add points, I need tokens. You can only interact with with the uh, with uh, with the registry, yeah. uh, on, before you can transfer it to other. Uh, interact with other smart contracts so there is um we worked with uh, token foundry they have like a special uh, smart contract that was designed for for these kind of use case okay um then second incentive so we're basically in the state that we're in is we're experimenting with incentive models on top of this uh, one way to do that is games um we looked at what are game models that also contain place contributions and the the first one we started with was the holiday treasure hunt it basically a number of clues that are uh, put out via Twitter and the answer is always a place that isn't on the map yet and then you basically have people guessing places by adding points of interest or points and you kind of uh, look you have a game then right and we've, we've been experimenting with stuff like this to kind of um, a it's use cases for the phone map, how it can be used for games, for example, spatial games. Um, but also B, it has the positive side effect that it uh, adds uh, POI data to our, to our map. So we did the first one. We did another one, uh, which was just around our office at the new lab. You can see here before and after. Um, and these are very, like none of these have monetary rewards. These are just NFTs that we mint to uh, winners uh, that have uh, illustrations attached to them. And um, we've, we've, it works, but it's also right now the um, incentive or like the, the game mechanics <laughs> have been geared towards like making a fun game, um, which means that like if you, if you guess twice or once, that's not a lot of points uh, added, right? If, if 50 people do that or 20 people, you could design the game mechanics potentially in a different way, which would result in much more points added. But it's been a more, let's say, enticing gameplay, which we also found important in the beginning. And we're going to experiment more with kind of games that maybe have more of a point addition in the end. Uh, we recently did one for Blockchain Week with, and we work with Block Cities, which is um, a kind of NFT um, um, a game company that do uh, specifically buildings you can collect. And uh, they, they've built out a lot of infrastructure based on our initial ideas and kind of do like smaller scavenger hunts and stuff like that, uh, where they basically release a set of clues and then you can win it uh, if you uh, um, uh, guess correctly. And they started to automate a lot of these processes. And what you can probably have in the future is like, um, yeah, digital scavenger hunts that are automated and have real monetary value to the, to, to the, uh, to the rewards. Um, here they also included some ETH rewards during blockchain week. And we're still like we we track the activity it's still pretty small uh we're seeing a, a, like 100 points maybe added per per um uh, game 
but it's an interesting way to approach both kind of marketing and a point edition, uh, uh, let's say, a campaign. And um, 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 yeah, also we're seeing this as ways to kind of onboard people. So if someone is on the edge of trying it out, this is a great way to kind of have a context to kind of uh, get started in um, for context. But um, then we're, we have another uh, kind of work in which Caleb has been very involved in, which is the idea of more of like classical gamification um, techniques, um, which includes a leaderboard, if you want to talk yeah, so uh, Leaderboard is straight from uh, most mobile games. It's an extremely effective tool, and mobile games took it from uh, sports and, and other events. So um, in terms of motivating people, uh, th this is a great way to do it without spending any money, right? So, uh, and in this case, we, we do see that it's working where uh, one card talk, but in order to make it work, we had to add identity. Uh, and so we used the three box profiles and we added uh, an optional profile that each Ethereum account holder controls uh, access to and the data within it. It's very important to note that, that a lot of where this value comes from is from the contextualization within the communities itself, right? So um, an NFT within your wallet that no one can see makes little sense. What is important here is to contextualize it within the communication or the community framework that these people interact with normally anyway. So if it's a discourse channel, if it's a discourse, if it's a discord, whatever, how do you bring in these things into that uh, uh, um, uh, communications tool or that community for it to uh, have some value and be a, basically a, um, a, a showing that you have performed some, something within the network, right? Uh, and, and therefore your voice can be counted stronger or something like that. Um, is there more, something more you want to add? Yeah, so we absolutely needed the identity layer. Mm -hmm. And then at this point, uh, the leaderboard has three time periods, an all-time time period, uh, and then this month and last month. And so each month uh, you guys have a, uh, or recently you guys have started to give away an NFT to the top leaderboard. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So um, we saw actually that the, uh, there was quite a spike um, from the first uh, leaderboard uh, announcement. And uh, we started looking into it and it was one user added 200 points uh, from LabCorp, which is a health, uh, what do they do? A health it, monitoring? Yeah, it's like a place where you can drop off medical supplies uh, or pick up medical supplies. Yeah. So someone basically added uh, added 200 points of a certain kind of company uh, locations to the map and uh, went to straight to the top of our leaderboard, not only for the month, but for all time, got a badge. And we also rewarded it with a discourse uh, kind of badge. And we're trying to integrate these things into like the community uh, communication tools as well. And here you can see uh, that you basically have a, a direct spike by minting an NFT, right? So I think there's a point to be made for uh, other looking at other models of incentivization uh, for smaller entries into uh, TCRs, or maybe this is an overlooked category within the blockchain field generally, where the focus on economic incentives is so core to uh, what we're doing. And uh, I am not sure if, uh, if social incentives or gamification might provide bigger incentives uh, for small risk uh, actions uh, than small economic incentives, um, or at least uh, compatible. And we can see that we, we have increases here, uh, which um, something like the uh, 1000 ETH prize pool for, uh, for the Block Cities Hunt didn't increase the points as much, right? So this is a very different, like it's, it's interesting. Um, so then we have another one this month uh, for May. This started a bit later. Um, we were a bit uh, late in the communication, but we see an increase here in the end as well. And we have one user, a, a branches, who's leading this month by adding a bunch of churches all over California. Um, and he was frustrated. He was second last uh, month. So I'm fairly convinced this is also motivated by the NFT badge. Um, 
And the idea is to um, roll out a fully fledged automated NFT badge system with basically, if you add 100 churches, for example, you get a special badge. Or um, we want to kind of build out, um, uh, kind of see how the NFT space also uh, lends itself to badge systems and how that can be plugged in into other uh, things. And also what's important here is, as I've mentioned several times, maybe too much, is the is how it also reproduces across the channels where these people interact, right? So uh, the uh, uh, May leaderboard leader badge, cartographer of May, does not have any value if it's not actually within the place, the only place in the world where that probably has value, which is the foam community. If I, like, I could basically um, write piece of code that reads out the Google API from Google Maps and then practically puts everything in a giant list and I batch upload it on Ethereum. What, what's the incentivation to not do that? Like, you, you might spend more on the Google API than you will on gas fees. Okay. And, and maybe even more than the foam tokens you have to deposit into those POIs. Mm -hmm. So it's an expensive endeavor. It's and an expensive endeavor. Now, you know, there there may be a case to to do that, especially it, there may be a case for the foam team to do that, even if the map activity reaches a point where where it needs to be revitalized. I don't think we want to do that with Google data, right. but yeah. I do think there it's interesting to look at um, transfers uh, of OSM data, for example, um, onto the system. Um, I mean, you could think about something like that. You do batch upload, and then you basically have a bounty on the verification of it. Mm -hmm. So you know that you basically do a crowdsourced uh, uh, like cleaning of the data for commercial applications, which basically Mapbox does today. That's Mapbox service, right? So Mapbox has basically a verification team, which sometimes fucks up, but mostly they do OK, and that's what they uh, charge for. So you could do something like uploading the whole OSM data set of places, and then you, you, the, the point stakes are the bounty for the verifiers to check this data set. And that would be potentially a use case. I would hope that the system uh, is a bit more mature, both in terms of scalability of Ethereum and in terms of the uh, improvement proposals of editable, et cetera. But it's interesting. Mm -hmm.